Hello, everyone. Welcome to our mini book bus for Black History Month. My name is Betty McDowell. I'm the Senior Librarian for Adult Services, and I'll be covering adult nonfiction. I'll also be joined by Shermaine Burleson, who will be letting you know about new and upcoming adult fiction, and Meg Miller, who will be discussing adult manga and graphic novels. So I'm going to go ahead and start us off with some nonfiction titles. And first off, we have memoirs and biographies. The first one I have tonight is Inve Inconvenient Cop by Edwin Raymond. Over his decade and a half with the New York Police Department, Edwin Raymond consistently exposed the dark underbelly of modern policing, becoming the highest ranking whistleblower in the history of the force and one of the country's leading voices against police injustice. Offering a rare, often shocking view of American policing, an inconvenient cop pulls the cur back the curtain on the many flaws woven into the NYPD's training, data, and practices, which have since been repackaged and repurposed by police departments across the country. Gravitating toward law enforcement in the hope of being a positive influence in his community, Raymond quickly learned that the problem with policing is a lot deeper than merely a few bad apples. Struggling with the moral dilemma of policing impartially while witnessing his fellow officers go with the flow, Raymond's journey takes him to the precipice of personal and professional ruin, Yet through it all, he remains steadfast in his commitment to justice and his belief in the potential for change. At once revelatory and galvanizing, an inconvenient cop cour courageously bears witness to and exposes institutional violence. It presents a vision of radical hope and makes the case for a world in which the police's responsibility is not to arrest numbers, but to the people. And we have the authorized biography of Tupac Shakur, more than a quarter of a century after his tragic death in 1996, at the age of just 25, Tupac Shakur continues to be one of the most misunderstood, complicated, and influential figures in modern history. Drawing on exclusive access to Tupac's private notebooks, letters, and uncensored conversations with those who loved and knew him best, this estate-authorized biography paints the fullest and most intimate picture to date of the young man who became a legend for generations to come. In Tupac Shakur, author and screenwriter Stacey Robinson, who knew Tupac from their shared circle of high school friends, and who was entrusted by his mother, Afani Shakur, to, to share his story, unravels the myths and unpacks the complexities that have shadowed Tupac's existence. Decades in the making, this book pulls back the curtain to reveal a powerful story of a life defined by politics and art, a man driven by equal parts brilliance and impulsiveness, steeped in the rich intellectual tradition of Black empowerment and unafraid to utter raw truths about race in America. It is the story of a mother and son bound together by a love for each other and for their people and the relationship that endured through their darkest times. It is a political story that begins in the whirlwind of the 1960s civil rights movement and unfolds through a young artist's awakening to rage and purpose in the 90s era of Rodney King. It is a story of dizzying success and its devastating consequences. And of course, it is a story of Tupac's music, his timeless undying message, as it continues to touch and inspire us today. And Judith Tick uh, wrote Becoming Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald possessed one of the 20th century's most astonishing voices. In this first major biography since Fitzgerald's death, historian Judith Tick offers a sublime portrait of this ambitious risk taker whose exceptional musical spontaneity made her a transformational artist. The coming Ella Fitzgerald clears up long-standing mysteries. Archival research and in-depth family interviews shed new light on the singer's difficult childhood in Yonkers, New York, the tragic death of her mother, and the year she spent in a girls' reformatory school, where she sang in its renowned choir and dreamed of being a dancer. Rarely seen profiles from the Black press offer precious glimpses of Fitzgerald's tense experiences of racial discrimination and her struggles with constricting models of Black and white femininity at mid-century. From the singer's first performance at the Apollo Theater's famous Amateur Night to the Savoy Ballroom, where Fitzgerald broke through with Chick Webb's big band of the 1930s. Tick evokes the jazz world in riveting detail. She describes how Ella shaped the bebop movement in the 1940s as she joined Dizzy Gillespie and her then-husband Ray Brown in the world touring jazz at the Philharmonic, one of the first moments of high culture acceptance for the disreputable art form. Breaking ground as a female band leader, Fitzgerald refuted expectations of musical blackness, deftly balancing artistic ambition and market expectations. Her legendary exploration of the great American songbook in the 1950s fused a black vocal aesthetic and jazz improvisation to revolutionize the popular repertoire. Throughout the 70s and 80s, 
Ella reached audiences around the world, electrifying concert halls, and sold millions of records. A masterful biography, The Coming Ella Fitzgerald describes a powerful woman who set a standard for American excellence, nearly unmatched in the 20th century. Next, we have How to Live Free in a Dangerous World, a decolonial memoir by Shayla Lawson. In their new book, Shayla Lawson reveals how traveling can itself be a political act, when it can be a dangerous world to be Black, femme, non-binary, and disabled. With their signature prose at turns bold, ma muscular, and luminous, Shayla Lawson travels the world to explore deeper meanings held within love, time, and the self. Through encounters with the gorgeous gondolier in Venice, an ex-husband in the Netherlands, and a lost love on New Year's Eve in Mexico City, Lawson's travels bring unexpected wisdom about life in and out of love. They learn the strength of friendships and the dangers of beauty during a narrow escape in Egypt. They examine Blackness in post-dictatorship Zimbabwe, then take us on a secretive tour of Black freedom movements in Portugal. Through a deeply insightful journey, Lawson leads readers from a castle in France to a hula hoop competition in Jamaica, to a traditional theater in Tokyo, to a Prince concert in Minnesota, and finally to finding liberation on a beach in Bermuda, exploring each location and their deepest emotions to the fullest. In the end, they discover how the trials of marriage, grief, and misconnections can lead to self-transformation and unimagined new freedoms. And next up, we have history. Black AF History, The Unwhitewashed Story of America by Michael Harriet. In Black AF History, Michael Harriet presents a more accurate version of American history, combining unapologetically provocative storytelling with meticulous research based on primary sources, as well as the work of pioneering Black historians, scholars, and journalists. Harriet removes the white sugar coating from American, the American story, placing Black people squarely at the center. With incisive wit, Harriet speaks hilarious truth to oppressive power, subverting conventional historical narratives with little known stories about the experiences of Black Americans. From the African Americans who arrived before 1619 to the unenslavable bandit who inspired America's first police force, this long overdue corrective provides a revealing look into our past that is as urgent as it is necessary. And in Science and Tech, we have Unmasking AI, My Mission to Protect What is Human in a World of Machines by Joy Bulamini. To most of us, it seems like recent developments in artificial intelligence emerged out of nowhere to pose unprecedented threats to humankind. But to Dr. Joy Bulamini, who has been at the forefront of AI research, this moment has been a long time in the making. After tinkering with robotics as a high school student in Memphis, and then developing mobile apps in Zambia as a Fulbright fellow, our author followed her lifelong passion for computer science, engineering, and art to MIT in 2015. As a graduate student at the Future Factory, she did groundbreaking research that exposed widespread racial and gender bias in AI services from tech giants across the world. Unmasking AI goes beyond the headlines about existential risks produced by big tech. It is the remarkable story of how Bulamini uncovered what she calls the coded gaze, the evidence of encoded discrimination and exclusion in tech products, and how she galvanized the movement to prevent AI harms by founding the Algorithmic Justice League. Applying an intersectional lens to both the tech industry and research sector, she shows how racism, sexism, colorism, and ableism can overlap and render broad swaths of humanity ex-coded and therefore vulnerable in a world rapidly adopting AI tools. Computers, she reminds us, are reflections of both the aspirations and the limitations of the people who create them. Encouraging experts and non-experts alike to join this fight, she writes, the rising frontier for civil rights will require algorithmic justice. AI should be for the people and by the people, not just the privileged few. And next we have poetry and art. Starting off with Deborah Roberts' 20 years of art work. The definitive look at two decades of work by Austin-based artist Deborah Roberts, with newly commissioned texts and a thorough dive into her archive, this monograph offers a comprehensive view of one of today's most significant social observers. An extensive plate section is accompanied by a heartfelt foreword from DeWood Bay on the tragic mischaracterization of Black children. An insightful essay from Echo Shun on the social and political histories of innocence, race, and the fractured nature of the contemporary Black experience. 
a celebratory tribute from author and artist Carolyn G. Martin on the musicality, humility, and generosity of Roberts's practice, and a free-ranging conversation between Roberts and cultural historian Sarah Elizabeth Lewis. By using images from American history, Black culture, pop culture, and Black history, Roberts critiques percep perceptions of ideal beauty and challenges stereotypes. She combines found and manipulated images with hand-drawn and painted details to create hybrid figures, often young girls and increasingly Black boys, whose well-being and futures are equally threatened because of the double standard of boyhood and criminality that is projected upon them at such a young age. Each child has character and agency to find their own way amid the complicated narratives of American, African-American, and art history. Deborah Roberts is a mixed media artist whose work challenges the notion of ideal beauty. Her work has been exhibited internationally across the U.S. and Europe, and Roberts received her MFA from Syracuse University. She lives and works in Austin, Texas, um, and if you happen to stop by the Blanton Museum in Austin, they do have a few of her pieces if you'd like to see her work in person. And next we have a poetry collection edited by Kwame Alexander, This is the Honey. In this comprehensive and vibrant poetry anthology, best-selling author and poet Kwame Alexander curates a collection of contemporary anthems that turns tender and piercing and deeply inspiring throughout. <clears throat> Featuring work from well-loved poets such as Rita Dove, Jericho Brown, Warson Shire, Ross Gay, Tracy K. Smith, Terrence Hayes, Morgan Parker, and Nikki Giovanni, this is the Honey is a rich and abundant offering of language from the poets giving voice to generations of resilient joy. Each can incantation, as Mahogany L. Brown puts it in her titular poem, is a jubilee of people dreaming wildly. Fresh, memorable, and deeply moving, this definitive collection is a must-have for any lover of language and a gift for our time. And I've got a couple of cookbooks, and then we'll be wrapping up a nonfiction. The first one is My Everyday Lagos, Nigerian Cooking at Home in the Diaspora by Iwande Komolafe. The city of Lagos, Nigeria is a key part of a larger conversation about West African cuisine and its influences throughout the world. My Everyday Lagos consists of 75 dishes that are all served in recipe developer and food stylist Iwande Komolafe's fast-paced, ever-changing home city of Lagos. These recipes reflect the regional cooking of the country and reveal two complementary qualities of Nigerian cuisine, its singularity and accessibility. Along the way, through informative essays that place ingredients in historical context, Yonde explains how in a country where dozens of ethnic groups interact, a cuisine has developed that transcends tribal boundaries. Yonde's personal narrative is woven throughout the book and cautions against being burdened by notions of authenticity. To those in the African diaspora, this book highlights food that may have been adapted and integrated into the cuisines of places they live. The bukas of London, Houston, Atlanta, Chicago, Toronto, and Newark all have their unique vision of Nigeria and are reflected in their food. The recipes, including classes like jollof rice, puff puff, and ground nut stew, are a starting point for the home cook, allowing them to trust the ingredients and achieve the variety of textures and flavors Nigerian food is known for. Beautiful photographs of the city and its people invite readers into the energy and pulse of Lagos, while the food photography entices them to make each and every dish in the book. And from Kristen, Crystal Wilkinson, we have Praise Song for the Kitchen Ghosts, stories and recipes from five generations of Black country cooks. Years ago, when O. Henry Prize winning writer Crystal Wilkinson was baking a jam cake, she felt her late grandmother's presence. She soon realized that she was not only not the only cook in her kitchen. There were her ancestors too, stirring, measuring, and braising alongside her. These are her kitchen ghosts, five generations of Black women who settled in Appalachia and made a life, a legacy, and a cuisine. An expert cook, Wilkinson shares nearly 40 family recipes rooted deep in the past, full of flavor. Delicious favorites including corn pudding, chicken and dumplings, Granny Christine's jam cake, and praise song biscuits brought to vivid life through stunning photography. Together, Praise Song for the Kitchen Ghosts honors the mothers who came before, the land that provided for generations of her family, and the untold heritage of Black Appalachia. As the keeper of her family's stories and treasured dishes, Wilkinson shares her inheritance in Praise Song for the Kitchen Ghosts. She found their stories in her apron pockets, floating inside the steam of hot mustard greens, 
I tucked into the sweet scent of clove and cinnamon in her kitchen. Part memoir, part cookbook, praise song for the kitchen ghosts weaves those stories together with recipes, family photos, and a lyrical imagination to present a culinary portrait of a family that has lived and worked the earth of the mountains for over a century. <clears throat> okay, so thanks to the Friends of the Library, we have four $25 gift cards to Black Pearl Books, which is a, a lovely Black-owned bookstore in Austin, Texas. Um, that is definitely worth checking out, even if you don't win one of the gift cards. Um, so tell us a title by a Black author that you're currently reading or looking forward to reading, and you'll be entered to win a drawing for one of the gift cards. I will be um, doing the drawing on um, February 6th, and we'll notify winners. <clears throat> so you have some time to email me. Um, and they will be e-gift cards, so you won't have to come pick them up. I'll just email them to you. And in case you missed it, these are some of our related titles um, that we've highlighted in past book buzzes. So uh, I've got our book buzz presentations, the slides online, if you want to check them all out. Um, but these are some that may be um, good for you to read this month. And if you want to email me, there's my email address. And I'd be happy to hear from you. And next up, we're going to hear adult fiction and um, manga and graphic novels. Thanks. Hi, my name is Shermaine Burleson, and this is the Black History Month book buzz for adult fiction. No Reservations is about a group of friends. One of their friends is dying. And basically, it's about them living their lives, uh, you know, pun intended, with uh, no reservations. But um, new loves, uh, divorces, new understandings of relationships and life. Um, it's as much about moving on without her as it is of them just finally really living their life, period. And they've been friends since childhood. So this is a big loss, but there are a lot of gains that are going to happen. Uh, Womb City is uh, kind of like a cyberpunk ghost story, uh, you know, uh, science fiction horror ghost uh, body hopping <laughs> adventure. And so, and it's a genre called African Futuristic. And so basically, um, it boils down to, it blends The Handmaid's Tale with Get Out. And so uh, Nala seems to have it all. She has fame, she has wealth, and she has a daughter that's growing in the government lab. But she's trapped in this loveless marriage with this police officer, and he... Um, basically uses a microchip to monitor her every move. So now her life is kind of in a precarious place and she has a drug field uh, evening that ends up in her getting into a car accident. So she gets in this car accident and she basically commits a crime by covering up and the body burying it. And she hopes that this is the last secret that she could keep. She has many secrets. Um, but truth comes out through the grave, basically. So the ghost of her victim viciously hunts down people that she holds dear. And she's racing against the clock to try to make sure that the remaining loved ones that she has are safe. And so there's a, a political conspiracy that this victim was trying to uncover and expose and um she has to help her figure this out or lose everything and so um it's set in Botswana which has become like a um a futuristic surveillance state and it interrogates like the patriarchy um and how patriarchy pits women against each other as unwilling collaborators in their own oppression and it also brings the question of how, just how far must a woman go to bring the whole system crashing down, right? So that's what Womb City is about. Uh, I think you pronounce this as Bogupsity. So don't quote me on that. But 
Um, this is a novel about like a young Jamaican woman who is going through grief. She's mourning the fact that her family is estranged and just um, what life is going to be like for her, where she is and is she willing to be or do things just to have family and family life. So she comes from Canada where she lives now back to Jamaica. She has an older sister. Their younger brother has died and she has the brother's ashes. She comes to Jamaica to see if they can be reconciled or some type of reconciliation. And she stays with her sister for two weeks and there's all these questions. She felt like abandoned by her and she didn't know why her sister would abandon her. And um, so she has a brother's ashes with her and her and her sister are not getting along. And she is kind of like, okay, I just need to take a breather. Am I really Jamaican? Because like, have I forgotten everything that I'm supposed to remember at this point now of who I am, right? So she goes to Kingston and she meets this stripper and the stripper tells her like about life, how things should be. Like, let's just have fun. Let's see where things go. And they are kind of feeling each other. And so she has to think about basically what it is to be not only a gay woman, but a gay woman in a super religious society and in Jamaica, because if she decides to come back home, she'll be all these things in one. So that's what this is about. Um, Queen of Sugar Hill is a novel about Hattie McDaniel, who was the first black woman to win an Oscar for her role as Mammy in Gone with the Wind. So it was supposed to be the highlight of her career, the pinnacle. She worked her whole life for this. And in 1940s, it was like the absolute honor. And so she took her place in history. But between this, tragedies and triumphs ensue. And so um, she is really trying to find her place as an actress and an activist and all these type of things, because those are things that are very important to her, both of them equally. And um, she has to go through four failed marriages. And um, just the fact that at this time, the NAACP is waging like all out war on Hattie and actors like her who take these roles that are very uh, controversial and very uh, demeaning. Um, and so whites only see her as Mammy and black people detest that she even did this role. But she has friends like Clark Gable. Louise Beavers played the uh, mother in Imitation of Life. And uh, Ruby Berkeley Goodwin is kind of like a black Hollywood uh, columnist, gossip columnist and different things. And Dorothy Dandridge and they're her friends and they're helping her navigate all of this. And this novel is basically about determination, dedication, and about what it takes to achieve your dreams, even when everything and everyone is against you. Um, a Song for Ricky Wilde is about a florist and a photographer. Uh, I would kind of say this may be close to How I Met Your Mother, but it does. it didn't take seasons and seasons to get there, basically. But it's told from the perspective of them just the passion and just falling in love and just finding somebody you can be yourself with just like who really sees you and she's kind of like the black sheep of her family or she feels like she's a black sheep of her family and so just to know that there are people or things that are accepted about you is just really she just really loves it so this is a really good love story um redwood court is about kind of like a neighborhood in Columbia, South, South Carolina, South Carolina, um, where her grandparents live. And so Mika is the youngest and she's telling this story in the 90s um, as she's coming of age and she's growing up about her, you know, grandparents growing up in Jim Crow and her parents growing up segregated, but becoming, um, you know, middle class and wanting their kids to have a better life than they had and those type of things. And she has an older sister who would rather listen to Atlantis Morissette than Motown. 
And it's just like figuring out all these things about all the spaces of where you are. And it's a celebration of ordinary people just living the American dream. Um, Acts of Forgiveness um, is about the first female president decides to create a, a forgiveness act. So she'll pass this act that allows black families to claim up to $175,000 if they can prove they're descended from slaves. And Willie is trying to get her family to like do this. And she's trying to help her dad's business. She's trying to pay debt. And she's living with her parents and her young daughter. And she's trying to keep the family together. Um, and the Forgiveness Act could help with that. But she's not getting a lot of cooperation. And it's up to her to verify their ancestry. And she just learns how complicated family and forgiveness can be. Um, ours is a story set in the 1830s and it's about a woman named saint in a town that she creates and so she kind of goes into all these plantations all over arkansas and she rescues enslaved people and she brings them to this like freed haven that she created on her own and it's just north of south st louis and it's concealed from it's magically concealed from outsiders. So you have to be brought in. And she does her best to protect the inhabitants. But over time, um, things just kind of get murky and memories start to betray her. And the town becomes vulnerable because she's basically holding it up. And it's four decades. And it's about um, Black surrealism, mythology, spirituality, and the limitations of love and freedom. American Daughters is about um, Addie, and she becomes an underground spy in a society called Daughters that are underground spies. And um, she becomes a very strong woman. Her and her mother were um, enslaved by a businessman in the French Quarter, and they're separated. And she meets this free Black woman, and they become inseparable and she was like, hey, you want to do a little spying? And she was like, I definitely do. Damn with the Confederacy. And basically she learns how to put herself first in, you know, a new future. Um, and Parasol of, oh, sorry. Um, the partner plot is about two, uh, uh, basically high school sweethearts. And they fall in love again, and they have a marriage of convenience. They basically got drunk in Vegas and got married. And they were like, let's take this to our advantage. Both of us can help each other. So they do. And then they realize that the convenience is basically a good celebration. Um, Parasol Against the Axe is basically about friendship, the elastic boundaries of storytelling, and so um hero she accepts an invitation that she wasn't gonna like basically accept but she finds herself in uh prague and her strange friend sophie and she arrives when the city is playing tricks because basically prague which is a Czech of uh, the capital of czechoslovakia is like basically alive and all these tricks that Prague plays on Hero and Sophie. And it's basically, so this is the way to think of it. So it's about like how much is like a story influenced by its readers or the readers influenced by a story and the battle between friends. And is it better to be the umbrella or parasol or the axe? And that will make sense when you read it. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you have an excellent, fantastic Black History Month. Bye. 
Hello, I'm Meg Miller, Adult Services Librarian, here with my portion, the adult graphic novels and manga. I'm coming to you from our new and improved and former special collections area of the library, now the adult graphic novels area of the library. Uh, we have been expanding. It's a very popular section, so I'm excited to tell you about a few titles um, for our Black History Month presentation. First up, some titles that we already have in the collection, so you'll be ready to check them out. We have Mosley from Boom Studios uh, back in October. The co-creator of Chew is out to smash the tech gods along with Sa artist Sam Lofty. In the hyper-technological world of the late 21st century, Mosley is a bitter old janitor on a mission from a higher power to unleash holy hell on the too-big-to-fail tech gods. Can one man bring down the corporate powers who've used their vast influence to oppress an all too complacent human race and hopefully win back the favor of his estranged family while he's at it? Mosley taking up the holy hammer and you'd better believe he's going to smash some sh until he sets mankind free. But what happens if he succeeds? What will happen to humans when they've been reliant on AI and technology for so long? From farmhand creator Rob Guillory and Sam Lofty, Mosley is a satirical sci-fi blockbuster perfect for fans of Eve. Next, in December, from Dark Horse Books, we got Black Solstice from the minds of Martian Desmond Rowe and Trayvon Free, the Academy Award-winning writing duo behind The Two Distant Strangers, comes a brand new graphic novel. Last winter, Solstice, the whole world turned upside down when every single Black person gained a superpower that lasted exactly one day before disappearing entirely. It's three days until the next solstice, and everyone on Earth is anxiously holding their breath to see if it happens again. Everyone except the Wallace kids. They're betting their lives, their powers will return, and they plan to use them to change everything for everyone. Next in January, earlier in January, we have this in Young Adult Graphic Novel as well from First Second from author Ronald Wimberly, creator of the viral comic Lighten Up, comes a soaring graphic biography that casts new light on the first African-American fighter pilot. On the eve of World War I, Eugene Bullard was a refugee of the great Jim Crow South who was determined to find a place where a black man would be treated as a fellow human being. His search took him from rural Georgia to the streets of Paris, from the vaudeville stage to the boxing ring, and finally, from the muddy trenches to the open skies. In 1914, Bullard joined the force to, def to defend France and made history as the world's first African-American fighter pilot. Also in January, we got the next Watson and Holmes, A Scandal in Harlem from Fair Square Comics. In the streets of Harlem, black men are going missing. Queer minors are being trafficked. Dreams are being broken. The mafia is running amok. And brand culture and social media are killing people. When the dirtiest of vices are ripe in back alleys and street corners, the nastiest of humanity's underbelly is put on display. With the police buried in cases, the community quickly losing faith, there is only one duo determined enough to bring to light injustice. This anthology, curated from the finest African-American talents in the industry, takes the classic detective team created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and brings them into the modern age. In the 21st century, where people are in desperate need of answers, John Watson and Sherlock Holmes return with five new incredible tales. Featuring stories from Brandon Easton and Stephen Harris, Hannibal Tabu, Carl Ballers, Greg A. Elise, as well as true Holmesian creators like Lindsay Fay, Stephen Grant, Eli Powell, and Dennis Calero. Watson and Holmes is part of the Nor is the New Black Hit collection. And also in January, we got Shook, a Black Horror Anthology from Dark Horse Books. In partnership with Second Sight Publishing, Dark Horse Comics is proud to present Shook, a Black Horror Anthology. With over 190 pages of terrorizing material, the anthology is filled with stories from a range of award-winning Black writers and artists. Stemming from a love of Southern Gothic horror, this anthology boasts a cadre of award-winning or nominated writers representing awards such as the Will Eisner Awards, the Ringo Awards, the Hugo Awards, and is the largest collection of Glyph Comic Award winners and nominees in a single publication, including work by David Walker, John Jennings, Rodney Barnes, and more. 
So sit back and follow us on a journey of terror, suspense, nightmares, and the darkest depths of fear. Finally, for January, we have Blackula Return of the King from Zombie Love Studios. Los Angeles is the city of angels. Two souls. One is looking for vengeance and one is looking for truth. They share one thing in common. They are both searching for the legendary vampire Blackula. Tina Thomas is a reporter for the blog, blog Dark Nights, which chronicles all things unnatural, uneasy, and undead. She meets a young man named Cross, whose family was forever changed by the vampire. Cross asks Tina to help him kill Blackula. Blackula, too, is on a mission. He is searching for the one who forever changed his life centuries ago. His name is Count Dracula. And in this month, we will be getting Nina Simone in comics from MBM Publishing. This is the story of an emancipation, that of a young Black and poor woman living in America marked by segregation. This is the story of a fierce battle, that of a musician involved in civil rights movement. This is the story of a long career, that of a pianist and singer as talented as determined. This is the story of Nina Simone, a unique artist, role model, and inspiration for generations to come. Genius pianist, fabulous singer, and committed artist, Nina Simone remains an inspiration for generations. And in April, look for Gleam from Drawn and Quarterly. Enter a future of defiant vitality in Gleam, imbued with cyberpunk attitude and in the rebellious tradition of Afrofuturism, Gleam is drawn with a fierce momentum hurtling towards a future world. Carrasco's distinct cinematic style layers detailed panels and spreads, creating a multiplicity of perspectives, at once dizzying and hypnotic. Vignettes unspool in proximity to our own social realities and expand into the outer layers of possibility. Whether in the club or a robot repair workshop, the characters in these three interconnected stories burst across frames until they practically step off the page. A boy becomes bored at church with his grandmother until he tries a psychedelic drug. A group of friends are told they need a rare battery if they want any chance of reviving their friend. Street style and cybernetics meet and burst into riotous dancing. Kindness and violence might not be as distant from each other as we think. Gleam unsettles with a confidence that could make you believe in anything. And another April title, one bourbon, one scotch, one beer, three tales of John Lee Hooker from Z2 Comics. Legendary bluesman John Lee Hooker lived from lived more life in one of his songs than the collective lifetimes of many. Spanning several decades of the American experience, one bourbon, one scotch, one beer tells three tales of Hooker's storied life through the perspective of those who lived within his massive orbit, weaving textured and interpretive stories that rise to the lofty creative heights of his music and fall to the gritty reality of trying to thrive in several unforgiving areas, eras. And for July, we have The Change from Dark Horse. Whoopi Goldberg brings new meaning to what it means to be a superhero in a new graphic novel. Isabel Frost is a woman who has spent her life as a wife, mother, and grandmother, a life she feels isn't all she had hoped for. With a husband who has grown in another direction, a college graduate with a degree in science, Isabel is an amazing gamer who plays with people all over the country. With the help of her comic-loving grandson and irreverent best friend, she must learn to control her abilities and embrace, embrace her new identity as the change, both the change of life and her surprising and extraordinary superpowers. And one last title from me in July from Zombie Love Studios, Florence and Normandy. Down on his luck, Malik, an intelligent young Black man with an engineering degree, delivers fast food just to make ends meet. His girlfriend left him. His grandmother thinks he's a disappointment and his ambitions and hopes are slipping away. He doesn't think life, his life could get any worse until an APB of a suspected criminal that matches Malik's description puts him in direct odds with Officer Brown, a cop with a chip on his shoulder who's looking for any excuse to escalate the situation. Now, Florence and Normandy, the cross street infamous as the flashpoint of the 1992 LA riots, may just be the last thing Malik sees if he makes one wrong move. 
but little does he know that this landmark corner is about to find itself at the center of another seminal moment of American history, the world's first alien invasion. Can these two men from polar opposite backgrounds put aside their differences and stop fighting each other long enough to find a way to save Los Angeles, or will they kill each other first? And that's all for me. Thank you for watching and happy reading.